the meeting started. This is Rules and Open Government Committee meeting for September 25th, 2013. And unless there are changes to the agenda, we'll just start at the beginning with the October 1st Council meeting agenda. Anything on page one? Page two. Page two, Mayor. There was three. Gonna, there was going to be an ad. I think Michelle might have the ad. Yeah. Accommodation. Okay, I'll we'll come back to that. To add uh, the accommodations at the end. Anything else on page two or three? Scroll down. Page four or five. Page six or seven. Or to the Joint Council Successor Agency agenda items on pages uh, nine or 10. Mayor, we need a sunshine waiver on part B of item two of, of this agenda. This is the, uh, the documentation. Documentation on the uh, loan to First Community Housing. Yes. So how long have we been working on this North San Jose, Pedro, San Pedro housing project? Yeah, too long. <laughs> Quite a while, and I think uh, I think this is coming back after receiving guidance from the right. State Department of Finance, so the Governor's Department of Finance. Somehow this has managed to survive the ups and downs of uh, <laughs> state government, and uh, we do have a very large grant from the state of California that's both helped this project along and, and delayed it as we've uh, worked with the, with the state. So it's good to see uh, action on the agenda. So I have some other requests for additions. Uh, Councilman Herrera's travel to Dublin, Ireland with the sister city trip, and Councilman Herrera wants to add accommodation for the National Manufacturing Week. Next week. And appointment of city staff and implementation board of the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency to replace uh, Joe Horbital, I think. Motion to approve the agenda with the addition to the sunshine waiver. Second. All right, we have a motion to approve with the changes. David Wall, you want to speak on this agenda? Uh, thank you, sir. Item 4.1, the sign ordinance amendments. I would still recommend that the city uh, encourage more of these billboards that are basically jumbotron television sets. I've had occasion of late to uh, go through several jurisdictions through California, Southern California, and uh, they are quite uh, impressive. Uh, there's a lot of advertising that can be squeezed in. Uh, there would have to be some type of monitoring as to the projection of light as far as in residential areas, but these signs are very, very effective, and um, they're almost to the point of distraction on the roadways. As to the issue of the North San Pedro Street Townhome um, LLC uh, project, I'm glad this project hasn't gotten so bad. This is in my neighborhood for dis disclosure purposes. I don't think this city needs any more housing. I think what the city needs to do is take a breather for a generation of no more housing and focus on services. But to give these folks a loan, I mean, come on, these developers have a ton of money in their bank and they're just doing these projects using other people's money, causing impacts into our neighborhoods that we, we don't need. I mean, uh, with reference to parking, there's going to be all parking on the street because of how you've incorporated uh, these benefits of basically no car parks or reduced car parks for these facilities. And this just isn't reality. People are not going to be getting out of their cars. And we have to wonder about the next generation of these uh, projects, whether or not they're going to start bundling parking as an addendum to the price of these homes. So I'm very much opposed to any of these projects going forward. And I would hope and pray that somebody would stick a knife into the heart of this project and it would be killed as I speak today. Thank you. That concludes public testimony. We have a motion to approve with the changes and the waivers on that motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? None opposed. The motion carries. We'll turn now to the October 8th Council agenda. Anything on page one? Page two or three? 
Mr. Mayor, note on item 3.3, the annual report that that will be distributed separately next, um, on Monday, the 30th. Does that need a 10 day yes, waiver? Yes, it will need a 10 day waiver. Sunshine waiver? Nine days instead of 10 or whatever. Right, so the annual report, sunshine waiver. Anything else on page two or three? Page four or five. Uh, we note item 7.1 is the agreement at digester and thickener facilities at the regional wastewater facility. We did have a substantial presentation at the treatment plant advisory co committee on that, but my guess is the council needs to see at least part of that presentation because it's you know, a big contract. <laughs> Very good. We'll do. Uh, anything else on page four or five? Or Motion to approve the sunshine Aye. waiver. Okay, I don't have any other requests for additions or changes, so we have the motion to approve with the change and the sunshine waiver. On the motion, all in favor? Oops, Aye. I'm sorry, before I do that, Mr. Wall, you want to speak on this one as well? Sir, item 2.2, the carry out bags. I think you should consider continue escalating the cost for these bags and putting the uh, any type of savings into the storm drain fund because Somewhere in the city, they haven't figured out how to protect over 30,000 storm drains that goes to our creeks and to our rivers. And that's where most of these bags and other debris end up. And uh, I mean, this, these were the photographs that were used by the administration to show how horrible the bags are out in the creeks. But the issue of over 30,000 storm drains not being protected, and this is going on, and the, the entire ESD department hasn't figured out how to do it yet. So we need more work in this area. Item 7.1, this digester rehab. Part of the report, sir, to council is that you should have a complete accounting to date as to the cost of all the consultant agreements with reference to BLP engineering firm that was hired for this a long time ago to do this uh, consultant work. And it took uh, letters and speeches by this citizen to uh, make inquiries into how this uh, engineering firm was, uh, got so close to be on an organizational chart at ESD and now I want to make sure that they're not part of Brown and Caldwell's subcontractors. And sir, this was a big, uh, a big issue uh, considering that this was a $5.2 million contract you know, way back when, when BLP was still around. And as chairman of the Treatment Plan Advisory Committee, you were aware of my letters and my speeches on this issue. And now we see Brown and Caldwell at 12 million coming in. Uh, how much work product did we get from the, the previous firms? And that should be part of the report. This is uh, this has been going on for too long. It's good to see we're making movement in this area. Thank you. That includes public testimony. We have a motion to approve with the waiver on that motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? None opposed. That's approved. We have new upcoming study session agendas to talk about. We'll come back to that general topic on meeting schedules, I guess. Uh, legislative update. Sacramento update, Betsy Shotwell. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Betsy Shotwell, Director of Intergovernmental Relations. I asked that this be put on as a placeholder if I had new news to report. Uh, the governor uh, is still uh, um, uh, waiting on signing some of the bills. He has until October 13th to do that, and there are 10 bills on the desk that uh, the t city took positions on. So, But I have no new news on that. We did issue, uh, with, in, with the state lobbyists in Sacramento, Roxanne Miller, we did issue a info memo last week on all the bills that the city is taking positions on, and we'll update that after the 13th with uh, new information. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? I just had a, a comment. Uh, I talked with the governor's chief of staff last week, and uh, they have stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of bills that they're going through, so I'm sure they're going to take 30 days for a, a lot of them, and uh, not all the bills have been delivered to them yet, so there's a, a lot of work to do. But she did say that the governor does pay attention and appreciates hearing from us and others that <coughs> where people are on the oppose or support is important to the governor. So, you know, we send in a lot of letters on the bills that are important to us and appreciate the fact that they, they pay attention and look at that. Anything else on legislative update or questions? And we'll move uh, the meeting schedules. Do we have any that we should release that we're not going to do? 
for yes. sure on a study session or something. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee, you are currently holding Tuesday, October 15th for a study session that we do not have a topic for. So at this point, staff would recommend releasing the date. The one thing that might come up that I remember hearing about was the possibility of the Cortex Retirement Board uh, restructuring report and depending upon the availability yes. of uh, the Cortex to present their report, do we need to hold that date for that or who are likely to fit them in someplace else? They can go on a regular council meeting date. But Good afternoon, Alex Frizz, Deputy City Manager. Alex, I think you're going to probably have to either turn that on or it's not picking up. There you go. Now it's going. Yes. Uh, Alex Strauss, a deputy city manager. Uh, we are l looking at, that is one of the dates we're looking at, although it, it looks like there may be several key people out that particular day. Right. So if you'd like to still hold it, but we're not we're not certain that date will work for that particular uh, issue. Okay, well if it turns out that's the only date we can do it, we should probably use that date, so let's just hang on to it okay. for, for yeah, another week anyway. Yeah, we will have people that are gone. That is the week of the trip to uh, Dublin, so I know we have at least I think it's also two or three council members. The chamber trip is that week sometime too, I think. All right, so nothing else on meeting schedules. The public record, anything the committee would like to pull from the record for discussion? Councilmember Ferrer? Yeah, I, I just um, uh, wanted to ask staff to comment on the letter uh, from Martha O'Connell, <coughs> Senior Commission, just to. Uh, just want to make sure that uh, mm. if there's anything we need to do on that. I mean, the language in uh, uh, our, our language is, is pretty clear there, but I, I maybe uh, maybe Rick wants yeah, to. I think on the uh, the language is the recommendation is to keep it, and I I would agree. I think it's important that people know that you do not need to be represented by council, so that we can yeah we can authorize a representative to represent yes. someone at at the park, and it does not have to be an attorney. And appreciate the letter. Um, coming forward to uh, to let us know about, about that circumstance. Okay, we have some people who'd like to speak on matters on the public record. We'll take that now. Martha O'Connell. I had one more thing I wanted okay, to say. Okay, I'm sorry. Just this is one minute, Martha. This may, be, this may be not allowed, but I just want to express to David Wall my condolences on the loss of his mother. Martha O'Connell. Uh, the reason uh, that this came before the Senior Commission is because I have reasonable cause to believe if you already haven't received a telephone call, you are going to be being lobbied by the park owners to take this section of the mobile home rent control ordinance out. At the very volatile hearing where one of the uh, attorneys threatened me with turning me into the DA and criminal charges that I could be put in jail and charged for this whole hearing, uh, the hearing officer finally ruled him out of order after numerous threats and told him that if he didn't like it, that the people he needed to contact were the city council. So um, the senior commission is concerned that you are going to be lobbied, and we hope that you would stand firm because without this provision in the mobile home rent control ordinance, seniors and low-income low folks who can't afford an attorney have literally no defense against a rent increase without choosing an adequate representative. Thank you, and thanks to the city attorney for his comments also. Richard McCoy. I also uh, wish to address the uh, senior commissions. Richard McCoy, uh, chairman of the uh, House and Human Services Subcommittee of the Senior Commission. Uh, senior commissions uh, encourage the mayor and city council to retain the wording of section 17.22.800 of the mobile home ordinance. And I have to agree also with uh, Councilwoman uh, Rose Herrera, the city attorney, and Martha that the people who live in these places do not have the money enough to be able to afford attorneys. And when it comes time for their rent to be increased or their property to be taken out from under them, they have no money to be able to go out an attorney to represent them, so they represent themselves. So allowing someone of their choosing or an individual to represent them in uh, these uh, negotiations and in the courts is a positive thing for all the seniors. Thank you. David Wall. I also uh, believe that uh, you're going down the right road and not changing this and allowing the representation as uh, previous speakers have uh, petitioned. 
I think it's time now, though, also to start seriously studying revising the entire mobile home park rate structures as far as pass-through taxes. This is in reference to garbage fees, storm fees, sewage fees, all these things act in concert and are cumulative as taxes that are passed through versus the actual property owner that should be responsible for this. Now, if individual mobile homes actually own the property they sat on, that would be a different issue. But these mobile home parks are owned by a corporate entity and they pass through what normal property owners can't pass through to, to people are these taxes. And that should be part and parcel to this rent control program that needs to be uh, revisited, renewed, updated, and periodically audited to ensure that uh, these seniors and other people, disabled people that are on uh, fixed income are not gouged uh, by these property owners who are passing through these, uh, these taxes. Thank you. That concludes public testimony on the public record. Anything else from the committee? Second. Got a motion to open file the public record. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? None opposed. That's approved. Next category are boards, commissions, and committee matters. So we have an annual report and work plan for the Deferred Compensation Advisory Committee. <coughs> Any questions or comments? If we just need to approve. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve. Mr. Wall, I think you want to speak on this one, right? Briefly, um, for the most part, this is a very nice report. There are a couple of comments. Uh, one, this committee has noted uh, over 560,000 and change in excess reserves. That was a nice uh, job by this committee that's returned to the participants. There is a little bit uh, lacking in budget tracking and monitoring. Uh, if you'll notice, it's somewhat inconsistent, and I think that that should be uh, room for improvement. Uh, consultant fund review, I would look at how are these consultants hired and who audits these consultants. I think that's fair. And that also goes into the insurance brokers, how they're chosen and what their rate of return is. Outside of that, I would just think that uh, this committee should, their, their minutes are, are somewhat uh, scattered as far as the timelines go. And I think that if they're going to have uh, discussions on certain categories, that it should be more uniform and better reported. Other than that, I think they're, they're doing fine. Thank you. Oh, one last comment. The Roth IRA for employees, that might be a way to incentivize employees to stick around if the city could find some way to come up with uh, joint funding for these uh, individual Roth IRAs, some type of matching funds if that's appropriate or allowable under the charter. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the report and the work plan on the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None opposed. That's approved. Section G, items to review and approve. First one is regarding AB 841 carried by Torres. Junk dealers and recyclers payment by check instead of by cash. We need to get that on a council agenda soon. I'm not sure when staff wants that. I assume next week. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this was, uh, 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 this bill went through the city's expedited bill process so that we could take quick action. Now it is on the governor's desk and we're asking that the full council reaffirm support for, for this measure. So if it could get on next week, that would be great. Okay. Councilman Herrera. Yeah, I, I think anything we can do to help stem the tide of this copper wire theft is, is really good in this bill because it's going to track purchasing of non-ferrous metal so that by, by having to present a check and and track it on um, the same day, I think it is. Instead of having to do it three days later, I think it's gonna be uh, really useful. So I would move uh, I move approval to support Second. this to the council. All right, you have a motion to approve and get that on uh, next week's agenda, Mr. Wall. I'm glad that uh, Council Member Herrera said, we'll do anything. Um, this gets to the issue, a very serious one, about shopping carts, stolen shopping carts. Now, it's a matter of record that I've immortalized North 10th Street at Horning with over at least 160 individual shopping cart entitlement program reports. Now, watching these two recyclers that are right there at 10th and Horning, one's on 10th and one's on Horning, is I've seen multiple shopping carts coming in with chopped up copper wires. I've taken photos, I've showed police, I've showed even a city sign complete with a pole and no parking and put that on the public record. Now, these shopping cart thefts 
are a mode of transportation. They are basically council's way of facilitating an underground illegal economy. And to, there's the, it's already coded in the municipal code to, to stop shopping carts from leaving the property. It's just not done, it's not enforced. They're everywhere, you know it, you see it. But when we talk about the transport of illegal gotten materials, especially recyclables, aluminum, glass, uh, taken on these shopping carts. Some of these people take, it's almost like a train. They have two or three of them that they're going through pillaging and also causing other type of residential crimes because of these shopping carts. But focusing in on copper, I've seen it come into these two recycleries many times, not only in shopping carts, but in the bed of pickup trucks. And I think that this council should expedite this and find some way and, and some intestinal fortitude to stop these shopping carts from getting past uh, the property owners of these storekeepers. Thank you. That concludes public testimony. We have a motion to approve on the motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Not opposed. That's approved. Item G3 would be next. Amendment to the Tree and Sidewalk Hardship Program requested by Councilmember Oliverio. Councilmember, you want to speak to your memo? Sure. The current uh, responsibilities for the homeowner to take care of the sidewalk. Uh, we do have a hardship program that has limited funding, and that hardship is made basically based on income. Um, but the other issue that's not re represented in income is catastrophic illness. We know that's the uh, leading cause of bankruptcy and uh, home foreclosure. So even though you may have an income, you may have medical bills that are not being paid by insurance of, let's say, $100,000. Currently, we don't really have a way to manage that. So I just wanted to uh, have staff uh, give their feedback and think if this is something we should do. We'd have no way of knowing how many people would uh, be in this position, but certainly there might be someone because the current system doesn't allow for that. So it would really be to, a defer referral to staff. Okay. Jim Mort Baldwin. Committee, um, as Councilmember Oliveira has described, the way our program is based, it is on um, adjusted gross income and it's two times the national poverty level that people can uh, be eligible for the hardship program. We don't have enough funding to meet all the hardship requests that we get on an annual basis. As we thought about this proposal a little bit more, we do believe though that extraordinary medical expenses probably do show up on a tax return in terms of deductions and those types of things. So we could probably look at that and, and identify if that is considered in the process uh, and could consider extraordinary medical expenses in the process. I think ensuring that we did it in a fair way and used uh, documents that are, you know, can be accurately represented is, is a concern of ours to make sure that we're uh, doing this in the right way. But we do believe after kind of further consideration that probably many extraordinary medical expenses do show up in some of these tax returns, which is the main document we use to determine eligibility. Okay, so this, if we refer this to staff to look at administratively how you can handle it, is that a, a way to move it forward? I believe it is. S certainly we, we can uh, evaluate it, um, look at our current process to see, you know, maybe we are considering this more than at first glance it may appear to be. Uh, and if we can set up a, a straightforward and objective way of doing this, it is something we can consider. We don't see that we're going to have a lot of, of additional hardship. But once again, we don't have enough hardship funds now. Uh, in the current year, we expect to run out before the middle of the year. So it's, it's potentially adding uh, more individuals into the program for a program that is already underfunded. But we do want to make people who do get the money do have hardship. And so we obviously got to check, uh, check the documents. So if we refer this to staff, you can figure it out, report back to rules and some period of time, and then we can decide if we need an ordinance change or other work that might be done. That would be yeah. fine. Yeah. Councilmember Herrera. I'm supportive as long as we realize we're not increasing the, f the funding to, to take care of this. We're, we're, we're looking at making sure that we're not eliminating um, a group of people that, that should come under this, um, should be intended by our, by our policy anyway. And it sounds like you're already kind of looking at that when you look at tax returns. So you're thinking this probably shows up anyway, but I, I don't have a problem with specifying it because it's true that Ex exorbitant men medical expenditures are, are one of those causes of people getting into big financial mm, problems. So, I'm sorry. Theoretically, exorbitant medical expenses are going to be a thing of the past after the national health care program is in place. <coughs> a lot more people will have insurance. So, right. 
maybe it won't be as big a problem in the future, but clearly it, c it certainly could be today. Uh, anything else from the committee? I had one request to speak, Mr. Wall. Councilmember Oliverio is to be commended for this. Uh, there is um, one idea that is not talked about is the administrative cost time, and I think that that should be a fee structure. If they're looking at having to pay a lot of money for their sidewalk repair, they could pay a fee for this consideration because there's a lot of document review, a lot of time, a lot of organization. The attorney's going to have to come up with some formula. Uh, so there's a problem in that regard. I say it's time to do away with sidewalks altogether. They're, they're a nuisance the way they're constructed. So a new type of material for sidewalks that's easier, that doesn't have these problems with tree removals or the kicking up the concrete is long overdue and it's in fitting with uh, the so-called green vision. Um, I think also that finance should be involved to create some form of annuity with which funding that you do have, that you could have an instrument, a financial instrument to, to, to create a fund, a restricted use fund. Finance is really good at making money. And we've discussed how they, they use different funds and they don't even pay attention to some of them and they make millions of dollars and then finally they catch up and say, hey, we've made a ton of money on this one fund. And they're really good at it. And I think you need to look at how you can turn these people loose to make money in accordance with the city charter and, and legislative changes that are needed to allow government to do this. But finance should be part of this whole scenario. Thank you. That concludes public testimony. What would the committee like to do? Uh, motion to refer to staff. Second. Okay, motion is to refer to staff along the lines we talked about. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed, none opposed, that's approved. Item G4 is our fireworks policy review. I have a request from uh, Councilmember Member Rocha, Campos and Camas to uh, review the current approach to fireworks regulation and see if we can do something better and, and presumably different. Uh, Councilmember Member Rocha, you wanna speak to your memo? Uh, just shortly. I think the memo speaks for itself, and I'm sure a number of my colleagues feel the same way. I've got three Fourth of Julys under my belt as a city council member, and I have had three years of um, concerns raised by the residents about the, the fireworks. And it's not just the smaller uh, front door fireworks, so to speak. It's more the commercial grade that are happening either at parks or uh, school sites where a lot of folks congregate. Uh, I recognize the limited resources we have here uh, for public safety. And so the expectation that they're going to be able to respond to all of those calls or even just the regular calls on that evening is extremely difficult. So because of that issue, I thought we might want to consider talking about this policy that we have on our fireworks uh, enforcement and maybe better ways that we could either manage it or deal with this matter. I appreciate the representatives of the police and the police department and the fire department being here, and I recognize they're here just to answer questions, not really to weigh in on any suggestions that are, li that are suggested here. And again, I just want, I put these on paper more or less just to have talking points about items we might want to look at for staff to look at as we review this. None of these are ones that I'm ready s to suggest we follow at this point, and I'm sure no one else feels the same way, but I, I think doing the research on this would be valuable for us before we get into the next year's um, 4th of July. Thank you. Well, I, I certainly think it's a topic that we need to uh, talk about from my uh, house. I get to watch a lot of fireworks every 4th of July from my back deck, and it's uh, an amazing display of thousands of illegal fireworks all over the city and all over the valley. Uh, tremendous amount of activity. And, and I do watch for the uh, San Jose Giants fireworks because I know they're going to go off and it's awfully hard to figure out which one is which because there's so many other competing uh, sets of fireworks that, as big uh, typically as the San Jose Giants. Uh, and so, it's obviously an issue that we should talk about. The question is, how can we apportion out the work? And uh, you've made some good suggestions about how to look at some criteria and, and data. And I think we can maybe come to an agreement that our current policy isn't working the way we'd like for it to work. I don't know that we need to spend a lot of time sort of evaluating that. I'd be interested in hearing from the, the professionals that are here. But uh, my guess is, having talked to a lot of council members, that. We all understand that what we're doing now is, is really not the best, uh, the best solution. So what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit today about and, and hear from staff about how, how can we sort of manage the work and not try to, n we don't necessarily have to do all the work, but let's start taking pieces of it to figure out exactly what we need to do so we don't have to start out with the assumption that it's a really big project. Maybe it's a relatively small project and let staff have a chance to 
to figure that out before we decide which direction to go. And I'll let Ed Chicata yeah. talk to that. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the committee, Council <coughs> Member Roach, uh, we do have representatives here from police and fire department. Uh, in our initial conversations around this topic, we did think that it could be helpful to split it into uh, a first step along the lines of a report on what's currently happening and uh, simply an assessment of existing conditions. I think as we get into what some of the policy options, resource um, uh, potential needs, as well as enforcement, then that becomes a much larger uh, discussion. So it might be helpful to start off with that initial read on, on what's happening operationally. Uh, in addition, uh, the our referral uh, suggests uh, bringing this back to both the neighborhood services and education and the public safety strategic support committee. And uh, staff uh, thought uh, is that perhaps identifying one committee to go to without a particular preference might be uh, a useful way to uh, consolidate the yeah. discussion rather than have uh, potentially uh, duplicative uh, reports. So just a couple of initial uh, comments, and certainly if staff wants to elaborate now or, or based upon some of the comments well, you have. Yeah, I'd like for us to sort out the work and the work plan before we figure out which committee right. it, it goes to yeah. and uh, how much work there's going to be. And I think some of these things, not really all that debatable. Uh, we know we need to do something. So. There's there's work that's already been done. I know Councilman Roach has done some work, and you know, I would start with by trying to find another city that's got something better, either a better program or a better record or a better something, so that because I know other cities have struggled with this, and if, if somebody's already figured it out, then we we're not too proud to copy uh, <laughs> other cities. And I don't know if this has ever been a discussion at League of California Cities and the attorneys uh, part of that or not, but. I no, it's, I think uh, some cities allow them, some cities don't. So I, I don't think you get unanimity. That's that's one of the issues. Yeah, well, I'm just figuring out if, if somebody's figured it out, then it'll be easier for us. And if there's a, a way to do a, a survey, literature search, or something to start the, the analysis, that might be a, a small type project that could be done without investing huge amounts of uh, staff until we, uh, until we scope it out. Councilman Herrera, did you have some you've, you've well, I'm, I'm, hear from Well, I'm staff? looking forward to hearing, obviously, from the professionals that are here, including, um, I, I don't even recall when we made the fireworks illegal and why, you know, I think I know why we did it, but it'd be very interesting to hear what's happened since then. I think that's part of the looking at the state of affairs now and getting that information will be really good, and I appreciate my council, council uh, colleague, uh, Council Member Rocha, for bringing this forward. Um, I also like the suggestion in the memo about at some point having the Neighborhoods Commission weigh in on this. So I think definitely if we're trying to come up with another solution, we certainly should run it by the Neighborhoods Commission. I'm not saying we start there, but I definitely think they should be part of that discussion when you start reaching out to the neighborhoods. But uh, yeah, I think w w reviewing this, because obviously we every year, and it's not just Fourth of July, it's other holidays too, we see this proliferation of fireworks. I watched one time my a neighbor's house uh, burned down because of a bottle rocket landing on a roof. So, and so those wouldn't even be contemplated under safe and sane and, and fireworks that would be legal. So, we definitely have the issue. There's lots of uh, funding that would be needed if we were really going to try to um, do more than we already do to to try to cur curb it. But I think it's we need to start somewhere. And I agree with the mayor. Piece it out and edge kind of piece it out. Look at look at the history. Look at where we are now. What's the issue? What are, what are the problems? And then. Start looking at solutions. Okay, you want to hear from the people who actually know what they're doing. <laughs> Good talk afternoon, to us, uh, Mayor. <laughs> instead of us kind of <laughs> guessing. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor and Committee, and I, I appreciate you having this concern. We have the same concern with the fireworks, and it seems like over the past five years, it's it's uh, even elevated more. Currently, we support the policy that's in place of no such thing as safe and sane fireworks, but it doesn't mean that we can't explore other options. And depending on council's um, uh, recommendations, involvement with the community, we could look at things as far as where we're at, where we can move forward, and what that'll lead to as far as what other jurisdictions are doing and how that'll fit into San Jose. But it is a concern for us. I could talk briefly about what the current policy is regarding what we do, not only for Fourth of July, but for other events. And that is before the event, I've, I'm joined up here by Captain Cleo Doss, our PIO, and Captain Honda from PD, thank you for being here also, is the first step that we do is prior to any event where fireworks might be um, used is to target the public through PSAs, local media, 
notifying them that not only is it illegal in the city limits, but it's also potentially harmful. The day of the event, we try to maintain a high visibility, driving through neighborhoods with our, with our uh, fire engines from 33 stations, just having a presence out there, answering questions, handing out some literature if we have it. And then as it moves closer to the evening where we know things are gonna start to happen, if we have the capacity, depending on call volume, and if it's safe to do so, we do have a policy where we will actually go to where they're lighting off fireworks, try to confiscate them, we'll leave them a, a receipt. We'll take those back to the firehouse and we'll work with our arson unit to collect those at a later time. And the receipt is just kind of a record of what we did, we confiscated them. So that's currently what we're doing. So, yeah, and just from the police department's perspective, we do try to work with the fire department on our strategies when it comes to first uh, New Year's and 4th of July. Um, for example, this last year, we try to message it beforehand through community meetings and that type of thing and through social media. However, just because of our staffing issues, we really don't have an effective strategy to deal with it on a citywide basis. We did deploy a couple smaller tactics to address small neighborhood issues, um, and that was effective, but we could not possibly do that on a citywide basis. And just to give you a perspective on what we're facing, the four weeks leading up to the 4th of July this year, uh, the police department alone received 2,344 calls for service regarding fireworks or explosions related to fireworks. Um, and the actual night of the 4th of July, we, and I don't have exact numbers around the 4th of July, but it's between 150 to 200 calls that we received, and that kind of overwhelms our dispatch center. Um, as far as deployment, we really don't have the capacity to deploy and respond to all those calls effectively. A lot of times those calls will get either canceled or just broadcast as information if the officers are available to respond. Great. So, Mayor, Councilman. thank you. I, to follow up on a few points made by the city manager, appreciate your feedback. Um, as far as one committee, uh, as the mayor pointed out, making that decision today is not necessary, but even down the road when we do get to a point, I think one committee is probably best. It was only two suggestions, so I really have no um, particular feeling one way or the other which committee it is, whatever best suits it at the end of the day based upon the work that you, you do. Uh, best practices, I couldn't agree more. Um, Sacramento is a, a personal example I have where I visit on 4th of July and they have, I guess, the so-called safe and sane. And I think for me, to the point that was just made about there is no safe and sane, if our intent or interest here when we first initially prohibited fireworks was safety, my interest is finding out what's the difference between that jurisdiction and this jurisdiction in terms of either fires or injuries. If there is no difference, then I'm not sure what we're accomplishing, especially given the fact that we're really, and I have a different opinion in terms of our enforcement, I don't get the impression that we're enforcing our, 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 our prohibition as it stands. I recognize, again, what their limited resources they have, so I don't expect them to, but my personal experiences from the residents is that it, they're ineffective, whatever it is we're doing, and they're, they're concerned and they're uncomfortable. And I think a different outcome at the end of the day or a different approach is warranted. Uh, we have the public safety interest here in, in my experience, and I know mo more folks complain rather than praise, but my experience is they're not happy with the current practices, and I, I think we should at least explore this through a discussion. Councilmember Oliverio. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks, Councilmember Rocha and others for the uh, conversation. Something I've thought about being here a few years and uh, having the calls and the circumstance and living in the neighborhood and hearing it and seeing it. Um, but from what I'm aware is that we're, un we haven't really cited anyone for this in years for this. That's correct. If you look at our statistics, generally we have all those calls that either get canceled or broadcast as, as information only. And if we do respond, a lot of times we will not cite. Um, I don't have any record of any actual arrests or citations issued this year for the 4th of July. Um, and I remember in years past, and you know, it's the year's always the same, and then I remember uh, going out with a Mercury News reporter in my district because this neighborhood, uh, and which typically happens a lot in the areas is they'll congregate at public schools and, you know, and they'll, they'll shoot off everything there. And so we walked through the neighborhood and I went with the reporter and we walked and knocked on doors and people are like, oh yeah, I liked it. I always go out and watch it, you know? And then you're finding people uh, employed in public safety putting it on or what have you. And that the neighborhood, it's almost like complicit that they know it's illegal, but they enjoy watching it. So they, and I think which begs the question of, you know, 
if you gave them safe and sane fireworks, not not bottle rockets, not sky rockets, would that make them happy enough? But understanding there's concerns from the fire department that those probably can be uh, thrown on projectiles or something, and then it ends up being a fire safety issue in some manner. But I think that'll be the discussion as we go forward. Um, but I'll just give you another little anecdotal story. I had a constituent call me uh, complaining about the fireworks, and I knew she was very good friends with a, a person a few blocks away from her that, that was bragging about having military-grade fireworks. <laughs> and I said, you know, oh you should goodness. probably talk to your friend because your friend's probably the one in the neighborhood shooting these things off. And that's part of the issue is that, you know, so many people um, enjoy doing it. And, uh, and even in the past, uh, under uh, the two fire chiefs back, we would often tell, hey, this site is going to have fireworks. We know it. It's been every year. And whatever happened, you know, there was no ability to enforce it. And so it's, I think it's, you know, we have to uh, have that discussion on <laughs> if it's, you know, so, so prevalent and we're not able to enforce it, then what is it that we do? Either we're going to allow some liberalization of the policy to allow people to use it and sounding like it would be against what the fire department would want, or we become more draconian and we really try to make an example out of people. We, you know, we, you have to catch someone, you have to cite them for something. And, and I think that's where the council is going to be on that discussion. So it'll, it'll be interesting. But it'd be good to hear based on how it's been framed what will come back. And, and also potential revenue, if, if there's any there in those jurisdictions that allow the safe and sane. I understand a lot of those require nonprofits to, to sell those. Um, but I would expect that there might be some revenue on the city side. Again, just all these factors we should consider when we're looking at the issue. Well, one of the biggest factors for me is I, I don't like putting our police officers and our firefighters in a position where there's all this illegal activity going on around them and they really can't do anything about it. And it's just a bad position. And if it's not accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish, then I'm certainly open to, to changing uh, whatever it is that needs to be changed. We do have some requests from the public to speak. Let me take that now. David Wall. Councilmember Alvario was correct in the statement of military grade fireworks. Now, Mr. Mayor, you as a pilot should pay close attention. Private aircraft come in lumbering around, what, 70, 75 knots as they're, as they're on their glide slope to San Jose International. They usually come in of south, southeast, out of the, uh, the commercial corridors. These mortars, for lack of a better term, have an explosive range of between 150 to 250 feet. Now these are estimates. I'm not certain that these are, I'm just gauging it from landmarks. A private aircraft coming in, making its final turn to get lined up with final approach at San Jose Airport could either have its wing blown off or the pilot completely uh, immobilized from one of these mortars hitting their aircraft. There is another scenario that I've discussed with Captain Honda, which I will not make a public record of, but it should be talked about at several layers of command at the police department for it's very serious on how these mortars can be used. This is not a community-based type thing that you can make an ordinance of. You need to put pressure on the state of California directly to stop and make certain that there are several layers of deterrence that is ex very, very painful. Seizure of property, mandatory prison times, because these fireworks, especially these mortars, are very, very dangerous in, in hands that know how to use them as a weapon system. And uh, it's just a matter of time, sir, before, unless you want to close San Jose International on July 3rd to July 6th or 7th at nighttime, uh, that, would, that would basically solve that problem. But these poor lumbering pilots coming in slow and low, um, they're sitting ducks for these things coming over these neighborhoods. They'll be blown out of the sky eventually in my neighborhood. Thank you. Martha O'Connell. I'd like to speak in support of the proposal to do a review. I live in District 9 in South San Jose, uh, around Communications <coughs> Hill, where there's these great big fields um, of very dry grass. And mobile homes, there's three mobile home parks within a few blocks of these things, and some of these homes can go up in five minutes. I have two other comments. One, I'm not uh, a part of the statistics on calling in because I started calling the police department and they told me don't bother to call because the by the time you, we get there, they're gone. So I could be calling every month because it's not just in July. 
around Communications Hill, for whatever reason, people are shooting fire fireworks off constantly. There's at least one party up on Communications Hill monthly. And I gave up calling years ago because the police told me, quite frankly, by the time they get there, they're gone. So it's very distressing to hear that the policy is not being enforced. It is a fire safety issue. That concludes public testimony. Committee, what do, would you like to refer this to staff, I assume? Yeah, I just, I just want to say I think there's a big difference, and I'm, I'm glad it's highlighted, between some of the, the kinds of explosives we're seeing out there that, that truly should not be in the hands of the public at all. Uh, and they just seem to be getting bigger and bigger. And I'm not an expert on it, but uh, on explosives by any means. But I definitely think we need to we need to hear about that and, and what we can do about that. I don't think many of us really um, ha have stayed up to date on on the types of things that are out there. We just know they get louder and louder um, e every year. So that is is one area I want to hear. What what can we do about that at the state level or or some some other level? I'm not sure what we can do locally. The other thing is. Uh, I, I really look forward to the day when we can have a public fireworks display like we used to have in San Jose. And I think a lot of people are missing that. It's not going to stop all the people from doing illegal fireworks out there. But I think, you know, it's a matter of pride and, and city pride to have that, that kind of a display. We do still have it at the Muni Giants. But, and I know that I've tried to, a couple of years, I've tried to organize it. I had a committee trying to put it together, and I just had so much on my plate that it was difficult for me to take it on individually. But... Um, I hope to work with others to bring it back to San Jose. We looked at Lake Cunningham as a possible site. It's been done there before and, and maybe back downtown. The city doesn't have the money to fund it, but we have other organizations that put together Christmas in the Park and other events. And I'm sure that, you know, if we, we work together, we pull together, get some nonprofits, um, look at how we can do this. I just, I just want to say I, I really want to see our fireworks display come back to San Jose as a matter of city pride. And um, I look forward to hearing the report uh, back on what our current state is. Oops. And I'd move approval of the of, of this. Um, the referred, referred to staff. Or referred to staff. Yeah. Staff. For part one. Of you the think you might need to figure out the workload assessment, or at least the preliminary plan, or something. I would need to work with the departments. My initial assessment might be 30 to 60 days in order to to put together that preliminary report on where we are today. Perhaps uh, pull in some of that information on uh, information from other agencies. I was looking at an October 12th open date now for our study session. So I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a history on what happened and what, when, when these were made illegal and, and, and then what's been the result of that since? Have we seen, I mean, I assume it happened because we had fires and we had issues. Um, and just maybe give us an update on what, what happened with that and what the results are since. Let's see what we can pull together, certainly. Okay, so motion is to refer to staff on the motion. All those questions. Aye. Aye. Not opposed? Not opposed? Go to staff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Open forum, I think, is the last <coughs> item of business for us. Mr. Wall. Uh, this is in reference with the Environmental Innovation Center. Um, through my public record requests, I've, I've stumbled upon how housing is assisting the Habitat for Humanity obtaining a $500,000 grant. Of course, I haven't found out the rationale why city machinery is being used to facilitate a internationally and nationally known so-called nonprofit. In addition, they'll be requesting of the city an additional $250,000 for Habitat for Humanity. Now, what is very concerning to me uh, is that Habitat for Humanity has been considered as a qualifying, as, as one of these qualified, active, limited income community businesses with references being used to substantiate the new market tax credit uh, financial structure. I look at this as a sham. Uh, I don't think Habitat for Humanity is anywhere near that type of category. Furthermore, with Habitat getting three years and four months of free rent, at taxpayers' expense at the Environmental Innovation Center, in addition to all this other money coming in, it really looks bad. Furthermore, having public works employees and um, environmental service employee and a housing department employee on the governing board of the Environmental Innovation Center smirks of material conflicts of interest. It doesn't mean they run real, the meeting I went to, they run really good meetings and their minutes are great, but these people have material conflicts of interest if they're 
they're using city money or city machinery to gather money for a grant to give to Habitat for Humanity, and they sit on the governing board of the EIC. Uh, sir, this is an embarrassment on multiple levels that you need to put a stop to. Now, we can make this Environmental Innovation Center work. Sorry, your time is up. Martha O'Connell. Uh, today, Commissioner McCoy and I came to address a letter in the public record and also an email went out to all commissioners telling them about this letter and telling them that they could pick up a copy in the back of the room because we try to just stick to the motion and not add our own personal opinions. We got here and there were no copies and this young woman was gracious enough to make me a copy but the point is that for some reason all of a sudden there's just the first three pages of the agendas and it would be really nice if we could just have a few more of these packets because we not only use them when we speak but we take the items and we, we take the information back to the senior commission for items that we might want to, to vote on. And I'd also just say we give a lot of our time and I don't feel I should have to pay 24 cents a page as a commissioner to conduct commission business. So thank you for your consideration. Richard McCoy. <coughs> I'll have to agree with uh, Commissioner uh, Martha here, uh, the idea of not having enough of the information out here at the table when I was walking into this meeting uh, is, you know, not appealing to those who may not have computers or printing devices to print off their own copy. And as commissioners, uh, we have a lot of access to other printed material by the city people, and we figured that this material here for these meetings is just as important, and we should have a right to have a copy of that available to us. Thank you. That concludes the open forum, concludes our meeting for adjournment.